set our fourth and final cornerstone, we've come to the edge of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Wilderness in Everglades National Park to talk with Park Superintendent Maureen Finnerty. Welcome, Chris, to Everglades National Park and the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Wilderness on this beautiful winter morning. Thanks, Maureen. It is beautiful here. It's a marvelous example of the diversity of our National Wilderness Preservation System. So far, when we've been dealing with our wilderness stewardship cornerstones, we've been looking at the big picture. Manage wilderness as a whole, preserve wildness and natural conditions, protect wilderness benefits. For our final cornerstone in the foundation, we need to look at managing wilderness more on a day-to-day -day basis. And as we consider our management responsibilities on a day-to-day -day basis, we need to provide and use the minimum necessary. Isn't there a subject missing there, the minimum necessary for what? It's really the minimum of everything. You mean like using the minimum tool? The minimum tools, that's certainly a piece, but the Wilderness Act specifically prohibits the use of certain um, activities and equipment. There's no use of motor vehicles, motorized equipment or motor boats, no landing of aircraft, and no other form of mechanical transportation. But it prohibits more than tools, doesn't it? Oh yes, it prohibits any commercial enterprise, permanent or temporary road, any structure, any installation. And are those prohibitions absolute? No, they're not absolute, except for permanent roads. The prohibition on commercial enterprises is limited to those that may be performed to the extent necessary for activities that are proper for realizing the recreational or other wilderness values. And the other prohibited tools and developments are limited to accept as necessary to meet the minimum requirements for the administration of the area for the purposes of wilderness. These limitations or other provisions apply to the administrative uses of the wilderness and not to the public use. Those uh, restrictions for the public are absolute. Well, what about someone who needs a wheelchair? That's mechanical transport, isn't it? It is mechanical transport, and that's a, a good point, Chris. The uh, uh, ADA, Americans for Disabilities Act, uh, does say that uh, folks who have disabilities in wheelchairs should be allowed the use of wilderness, but we don't have to modify the wilderness to allow that use. Okay. Well, let's get back to Section 4C. Accept as necessary to meet minimum requirements is more than just picking the minimum tool. Yes, it's, it's giving consideration to whether the action that you're contemplating is even necessary at all in the wilderness. For example, before you decide to use hand tools to build a bridge in the wilderness, is the bridge absolutely necessary? And before you decide to put in trail directional signs in a wilderness, is that necessary? And then a good example here in the Everglades is we get constant requests for research, research to be done in the wilderness. Is it necessary? Can it be done someplace else? And those questions all have to be answered. And then if the answer is yes, then you decide what's the minimum tool to get the job done. So first you decide if any action is necessary, is necessary, and then you decide what the least impacting way of doing that would be. And this do doesn't just apply to future actions. I think it also requires us to go back and look at what we currently have in wilderness areas. It may mean removing some things that aren't absolutely necessary and appropriate to the wilderness experience. Our second cornerstone talks about preserving wildness and natural conditions. And our first cornerstone is to manage wilderness as a whole. Maureen, do you have an example from here at the Everglades where using the minimum necessary is brought into play with these cornerstones? Well, I think a very good example is the one of the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow. Excellent. That brings in another law, too, doesn't it? It brings in the Endangered Species Act. So what kind of alternatives were you looking at in terms of enhancing the sparrow population? We evaluated a number of alternatives that were put on the table. Some required quite a bit of manipulation. Um, for example, the introduction of, of certain kind of grasses into the area that the, the sparrows inhabit, or um, looking at what kind of predators that might need to be removed in order to, to protect the sparrow, looking at, at the building of dams in order to channel the water in a certain direction uh, to improve the, the overall habitat. And those were rejected for two reasons. One, I think they were uh, looked at as uh, 
single, almost single species management and what impact would they have on, on other species. And also the fact that this is wilderness and uh, that kind of habitat modification uh, is, is not appropriate. And returning to a more natural sheet flow of water uh, is much less intrusive, preserves wilderness values, preserves wildness, and also helps the management of a number of species uh, while not hopefully de detrimental to the endangered species. So you found that by using the minimum necessary, you not only manage wilderness as a whole, you weren't managing just for the sparrow, and you've not only preserved wildness by uh, keeping out these additional trammeling influences, but you've also preserved natural conditions by restoring the water flow. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And uh, so that was really the best alternative for us. Well, using and providing the minimum that's required really impacts three sets of values. It impacts the social values, whether those are received on site by a visitor or the existence values held by someone who'll never visit the Everglades or any other wilderness. And then there are the biophysical values of a naturally functioning ecosystem. And then there are the values of wilderness itself, that antidote to our increasing population accompanied by expanding settlement and growing mechanization that starts the act. There may be time, Chris, when the minimum impact on one set of values, like the biophysical values, is less significant, but the impacts on another set of wilderness values, the social resources, may be more significant. Uh, can you give me an example? I think the best example is the use of helicopters to ferry equipment into wilderness areas. It certainly is faster and it has less impact on the trails, but it certainly makes a lot of noise for those that are trying to enjoy the solitude of the wilderness experience. You could argue that with a helicopter, the duration would be for a shorter period of time. But on the other hand, can you consider the use of a helicopter a viable part of providing an antidote to the growing mechanization that Congress intends wilderness to be? So all of these actions or potential actions need to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, obviously applying those provisions of the act uh, that are appropriate. And, uh, and that's our job as managers is to do that. Yes, we've talked with Jim Bedwell at Mount Evans a, a little bit about how to make that decision and to help managers further weigh the pros and cons. The Arthur Carhart National Wilderness Training Center has developed a minimum requirement decision guide to help determine just what is the minimum necessary. In the end, are you saying it depends? Well, yes. As long as we apply the prohibitions that are stated in the Act, Exceptions to the statutory prohibitions must be based on, as the Act says, the minimum requirements for the administration of the area for wilderness purposes. Administer it for its wilderness purposes. Mm -hmm. And that means? Well, I think practically we, uh, we always hear that um, we don't have two weeks to ferry materials into a wilderness when we could fly them in, in in an hour or two, or we don't have the training or expertise to use uh, cross-cut saw teams, we need to use mechanized equipment, and you know, issues of, of finances and training and priorities should not be limitations as we consider the use of, of minimum tools, or they shouldn't drive that process unnecessarily because we can always justify the use of a motorized piece of equipment. And you, you have to think about the cumulative impact. Absolutely, because once that becomes your minimal, minimum tool, then it's easier the next time to use it, and the next time, and the next time. And then eventually you end up with um, an area that has no contrast with those areas where man and his own works dominate the landscape. And thank you for spending time with us, helping understand the fine points of using and providing the minimum necessary. Use and provide the minimum necessary when managing wilderness as a whole, while you preserve both wildness and natural conditions, and while protecting wilderness benefits.